I would encourage you to turn your Bibles this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. If you're familiar with the letters to the churches in Corinth, you will know that the Apostle Paul is writing these letters and he's addressing many issues. There are two letters, and in the first letter, Paul addresses issues of disunity in the church, a misunderstanding of the resurrection, and the acceptance of a particular sexual sin. You think Paul could be writing a letter to one of our churches today. He was addressing spiritual needs and issues that had seeped into the early church. And we get to the second letter to the church in Corinth. And this letter was actually written within a year of the first letter. So pretty pretty close proximity. And Paul, again, he had spiritual concerns for the church. But there's another reason for this letter There were those that had seeped into the church and they were painting a bad picture of Paul. They had actually been false teaching that the Apostle Paul was being discredited and should not be accepted as an Apostle. They were questioning even his delivery of the Gospel. And so Paul is addressing this in the early part of the letter in 2 Corinthians. Read that in the first few chapters. In chapter 3, Paul describes their work as ministers in the new covenant to be unlike that of Moses because their message reflects Christ's glory and it is unveiled. Think about that. He's talking about when Moses came down off of the mountain with the law and he had to wear a veil because the glory of God was upon him, but the people were unable to look at it. Paul says our ministry in the new covenant is not that way because the glory of Christ is in us and it's ever increasing. It's an interesting thing to think about the ministry of the gospel. And so then that brings us to chapter 4 and the therefore. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary... By setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of believers, of unbelievers, so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show us that an all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to the death of Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise with us Jesus, with us in Jesus' presence and present us to you in his presence. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore. We do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. 
For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on what is, what is seen, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, that we have these words of encouragement in this chapter. And God, I pray that you would help us to understand there is a simplicity in this message. Lord, would you help us to understand that there is a truth that is revealed here and it is plain. And God, help us to carry that each and every day in our own lives as we profess our testimonies for Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This is a quote from A.W. Tozer. Those churches are the truest that stay closest to the word of God. Even to this day, it is so, because this fidelity or loyalty carries a price many are not willing to bear. Not all churches remain firmly rooted in the scriptures. How relevant is that today? Because the loyalty carries a price that many are not willing to bear, not all churches remain firmly rooted in the scripture. Make no mistake, today the truth is under attack. It was no different in the time of Paul. And we see that truth being under attack. And certainly we can see it in the life of Paul. He suffered greatly for the gospel. Paul was persecuted and suffered greatly for the gospel. He was willing to suffer for the gospel. But one thing Paul was never willing to do was to distort the truth. He would never distort the truth for temporary gain. Why do churches distort the truth of the gospel? Why would a minister today be willing to distort the truth of the gospel? You probably already have some answers to those questions. One of them that comes to mind is prosperity. They can use the things of the gospel to benefit themselves. In fact, there have been many in our nation who have become rich, quite wealthy, by a distortion of the truth of the gospel. I will say that maybe perhaps more relevant today is an acceptance. That the gospel is being adjusted to line up with the things of this world. And issues like sin are rarely preached upon. The issues of immorality are things that just make people uncomfortable. And certainly that's not what they want to come to church to feel uncomfortable. And yet, how important is the doctrine of sin to the gospel of Jesus Christ? In fact, there is no gospel of Jesus Christ if we don't discuss the doctrine of sin. Paul was unwilling to adjust the truth of the gospel he says, rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. Verse 2. And how does he accomplish this? How does he accomplish this? By setting forth the truth plainly. He sets forth the truth plainly. If you're familiar with Paul, and the teachings of Paul, you know he presents the gospel time and time again. He presents the gospel often, and he presents the gospel plainly. He presents it plainly. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This righteousness from God comes from faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That's Romans chapter 3. Why do we make it so complicated? 
I think we've made the gospel a very complicated thing. And although spirituality can be something that is complicated, you think about talking to somebody for a matter of their soul, right? There's a, there's a difficult depth to that. But when it comes to the story of Christ, that Jesus is Lord and he died for the sinner, he died on the cross and on the third day rose again, and those that put their faith and trust in him will also be risen to life again. That's the story. That's the gospel. Do we say that? Do we speak it? Do we just say it out loud? Or do we complicate it? Do we make it this big complicated thing that we really just can't get to that story? We can't get to the gist of it. How does Paul simplify this? Point number one of the sermon today is this. Solo Christo. Does that sound familiar? In Christ alone. Look at verse 5. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for Jesus', Jesus sake. For God, who said, let the light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. We as believers not only have the knowledge of Jesus Christ, we carry the light of Jesus Christ, right? And in carrying that light, we carry the gospel. And it's, I really think it's simple. Is it that simple? And we come up for excuses and reasons why we don't profess the name of Jesus. Even just that. Speaking the name of Jesus. When is the last time you had that opportunity where you could simply say, Jesus is Lord? That opens the door for a deeper conversation. That opens the door for what do you mean by that? What does that actually mean? Well, he has the power over death. Jesus died and then was raised to life. Why did Jesus have to die? Jesus was sacrificed for our sin because God is a just God and there will be a punishment for sin. And all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Think of the elements of the gospel, the elements of the good news, they're all within that. And many times they're within Paul's description of this. But are they complicated? Is it really all that complicated? Or we have, made, have we made it a very complicated thing? That could be the excuse. For the believer, that could be the excuse. I don't, I don't know how to say that. I don't know how to present the God. I might not say the right thing. I might not. And yet... We simply need to tell the story of Jesus, the story of Christ. And we carry that light within us. We have the knowledge of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is with us when we speak the gospel. Certainly, the Spirit who is with Paul and his companions as they preached the gospel of Jesus. What keeps us from doing that? What keeps us from speaking Christ? What keeps us from telling others our story? I think a second thing that could happen there is the concern of rejection, right? That if I say these things, they won't be received well. Matthew Henry writes, The design of the devil is to keep men in ignorance, and when he cannot keep the light of the gospel out of the world, he makes it his great business to keep it out of the hearts of men. Look back at verses 3 and 4. Paul writes, And even if our gospel is, being, gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is in the image of God. He talked about the veil in the previous chapter that the Israelites, that, that Moses literally was glowing with the glory of God, and if they saw it, they were unworthy of it. Like, it was too righteous for them. They couldn't see it. 
And he talks about how that veil is no longer there, right? He, like the glory of Christ is in us and ever growing and, and it doesn't need to be veiled. We can carry the light. We can carry that glory. And yet, what's the veil that exists? The God of this world. world. Did you notice that lowercase? It's pretty critical there. The lowercase God of this world. Who would that be? That's another way of saying Satan, right? That Satan is determined to keep people, to keep unbelievers from understanding the gospel. Not only understanding the gospel, but even opening their hearts to the idea of it, even thinking of it, even looking upon it. He has he is put a callus over their hearts to even receive it. And you may have experienced this as a believer. And it may keep you from speaking the name of Christ, but it should not. How did Paul handle it? A lot of uh, his connection to the church in Corinth, and when he planted the church in Corinth, we read back in Acts chapter 18. And in in chapter 18 of Acts, Paul is preaching as he often did. He would go to the synagogue during the Sabbath. That's when the most people were gathered there. And so who would Paul would mostly be addressing? At the synagogue, Hebrew synagogue, Jews. He was preaching to the Jews, and, and, and so often this pattern would repeat that he'd be preaching the gospel to the Jews. He'd be saying, Jesus is Lord, he died and was raised to life, and the Jews would be resistant. The Jews would reject it. Why? Because their hearts were veiled. They could not get the story of Christ. They wouldn't hear it. And so, of course, when this happened to Paul, he would step back And he would say, I need to find a consultant to help me reach these people. I need to write a 12-step program and change how I am presenting this story because I must be saying something wrong. Is that what Paul did? Time and time again, this is what Paul did. Acts 18, verse 6. He shook out his clothes in protest to them. And he said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Now, did Paul ever preach to the Jews again? Well, he did it in the very next chapter, if you're familiar. He continued to go to the synagogue. Paul's heart was for the Jew. He he wanted the Hebrew people to come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. So don't hear what I'm not saying. This isn't a lack of compassion for the lost. That's not what this is. You can still have compassion for the lost. You can still be praying for those that are lost and whose minds are veiled and and do not want to hear the gospel. But we must move on. There is ground that is fertile. (laughs) There There are places where the gospel is being received. For Paul, that was the Gentile people. It's who he's addressing in these letters to Corinth. Paul's conscience is clear because he spoke the truth plainly. Jesus is the Christ. Solo Christo. It's alone. Christ alone. Only Christ has the power to save. That's the message. And think about the freedom that we have in that. It's not what we add to it or how good of a Christian we are, or how well we are doing. Those things are important, right? Our testimony is important. The testimony of Christ is far more important. Think about it. We have the story of the gospel. We have the story of Christ. In Christ alone, our responsibility is to set forth the truth plainly. And there's even more freedom for us here that we read in the, in the verse 7 of the, uh, back to chapter 4 of Corinthians. It says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this is all surpassing power that is from God and not from us. Another reason Paul was released from that responsibility is because the ultimate power doesn't lie with us. It is God in us. 
There's nothing we are going to do or add or change or develop in the gospel that's going to reach someone for Christ. It's only through the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, to cut through that callous, to cut through that veil. We can't do that. In fact, we're free from that. And therefore, we should not be discouraged when we're rejected with this message of Christ. In fact, we should probably expect it. We should probably expect it. How much influence has the God of this world had to callous the minds of unbelievers? We know that's there. It should be expected. But we shouldn't be discouraged in that because the power is with God alone. I'm thinking about this jars of clays, jars of clay. If you have a King James or an older reference, it was uh, earthen vessels. These earthen vessels that carry this light, they carry this power is the strength in that pot of clay. No. The strength is in the light. The strength is what is in that vessel. I can't help but think Paul must be reflecting on Gideon. Do you remember the story of Gideon? I'm sure some of you remember the story of Gideon. It's found in Judges chapter 7. If you don't remember, I'll, I'll just refresh your memory quickly here. Like in Judges 7, we learn of Gideon who is gathering this army of men to take on the Midianites. And his men is, is large. He's got this large group of fighters, 32,000 to go take on the Midianites. And God says, your army's too big. This victory will be mine, right? That's what he tells him. And so he says, if anybody's concerned about going into battle, if anybody's fearful, they can go home. How many went home? About 20,000 went home. It's just like that. Went from 32,000 to 10,000 men. Now he was ready to take on the Midianites, right? No. God says, still too many. I'll, I'll divide them out. We'll figure out a way. Remember, they go down to the edge of the water. It was based on how they drank the water. Some men knelt down, other men lapped the water up. He said, yes, the men that lapped the water up, how many men, do you remember how many men? 300, 300 men to take into battle. And they were taking on the Midianites when God describes the scene in the valley of what the Midianites, there were other, other uh, pagan nations there as well. They were gathered and said it looked like the locusts of the field, like sort of like the sands of the seashore you couldn't count. That's how many people they were taking on, 300 men. This is an excerpt from from Judges chapter 7. It says, Dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed the trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all the men with torches inside. The three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, all of them with the torches inside. It says, The three companies blew the trumpets, smashed the jars, and grasping the torches in their left hands and holding their right hands to the trumpets they were to blow, they shouted, a sword for the Lord and for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying out as they fled. The power, right? We see it in that story. I mean, it's, it's so obvious. And I, I can't help but think that Paul was reflecting on this, that we have treasures and jars of clay that show the all-surpassing power of God. It is in him, not from us. Not from us. And there's, there's some freedom in that. We get on to the next verse here in, in, in verse 8. We use this sometimes as encouragement. It's, it's, it's getting into Paul's persecution for sure. Verse 8 says, We are hard-pressed in every side but not crushed, perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. Have you heard that before? You've perhaps heard it repeated before. And we like to apply it <clears throat> to ourselves. This is Paul and his, will, and his companions and their willingness to suffer for the gospel. They had such a willingness to suffer for the gospel. They were willing to suffer and even face death. To even face death. I'm thinking about Pastor John's illustration last week of the cross. And we don't often think of it for, because of the, the beauty of it, and there is beauty in the cross, as he mentioned, but like we don't think of it as this instrument of death. It was used for execution, right? And certainly, we light the cross. There's a beautiful cross, you know, but that cross 
represents the death of Christ. He died on it. And Paul is saying, we also carry the death of Christ. He's carrying that around with him. It's like, wait, is this encouragement? You probably, like I said, you've heard, I've heard these verses brought as an encouragement. How is this an encouragement? We're talking about all kinds of persecution and then carrying around the death of Christ. How can this be of an encouragement? How can we take encouragement from it? The answer comes quickly. Look at verse 13. It is written, and I believe, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. Man, Easter's right around the corner. And it's Easter Sunday, you know, like Matt, Pastor Matt told me this years ago, far before I felt a call to ministry or full-time ministry. And he would say, Easter Sunday, the Super Bowl Sunday for pastors. You're like, what? What are you talking about? But, you know, <laughs> I felt the call to ministry and around the church a whole lot more. And man, you show up on a Sunday. What an event. What an excitement. We know that Jesus lives. Jesus is alive. He did not remain in the grave. That the death of that cross represents the resurrection of Jesus. Do you believe it? Do you have faith in that? And I think it is kind of, it's great. Easter's great. I love it, right? It's spring is in the air, the flowers, and there's traditions and family and fellowship, and all of those things are awesome. But it sh should it be that much of a rise and that much of a fall remembering the resurrection of Christ? I mean, I just, that excitement, and it is, don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. There is an excitement. There is a unity. There is a love and a fellowship. We do share that when we gather. But Jesus is alive. Imagine that. Think of the encouragement in that. That's, that's why Paul can say, not crushed, not in despair, not abandoned, not destroyed, even in the midst of his persecution, even in the midst of facing death all day long, Paul is rejoicing in the resurrection of Christ. It should be the same for believers. Point number two is this. We have the but nots. We have the but nots. But not crushed. But not in despair. But not abandoned. But not destroyed. I don't know what you're dealing with or struggling with. I don't know what your stresses are on this side of eternity. But they're not the end. That's not the end. We live in the resurrection of Christ. We can take encouragement in the resurrection of Christ. In the final verses, Paul returns to how he started the chapter. And if you look back as to how he started the chapter, you will notice in verse 1 he opened up and said, we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. And look at it in verse 16, he says this again. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. I had another birthday last month. It happens every year in February. I guess as long as I'm alive. And it occurred to me that I'm probably not as agile as I was last year. Now, People a few years older than me want to throw something at me. Isn't that funny? I'm, I'm, I'm creeping up on 50 now. But, but let me just say that it's all relative to the decade you're in because if a young 20-year-old comes to me and talks about the aches in his shoulders, then I can be like, yeah. But I have learned that I won't talk about my aches 
to anyone in the decade beyond me. <clears throat> because that is yet to come. Have you ever felt like you're wasting away? Have you ever felt like you're wasting away? <laughs> Our flesh is wasting away. It doesn't take long. I'm, young people, you can just not listen for a little while. It doesn't take us long to realize in our adulthood that we are dying. We are in these vessels that are dying. And that actually carries a weight. We carry the burden of that, right? That we're walking around in bodies that are failing us. What does Paul say? Although inward, outwardly we are wasting away, Inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. Our souls, the eternal, what remains, is being renewed day by day. It's getting better. It's getting closer to the things of God. It's getting closer to the glory of God. That we can reveal God now in a certain way. Paul is talking about this, right? We have the light of Christ and we can reveal the glory of God, but that's being renewed that one day we're going to glorify God in the way that is perfect. That's what we're headed towards. We're headed towards that as believers. Can you take encouragement in that this morning? Paul says, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. I hope that doesn't cut you. I really do. I hope that doesn't belittle your troubles and your difficulties. They're real, right? We struggle with stuff. And for Paul to say, light and momentary troubles, you know, all oh, easy for you to say, Paul, you've had such an easy life. Right? I mean, Paul can write this. It's like he has the authority to write this because he understands what it means to suffer. Stoned and left for dead. Beaten. Flogged, right? Imprisoned, literally in chains for the gospel. And Paul is saying, light and momentary in light of what is to come. That's, we can take great encouragement from that. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the eternal glory far outweighs anything that we'll experience on this side. We should focus on that. So much so that he finishes it this way, verse 18. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. How often do we focus on the temporary things? Why? We fix our eyes on what's not going to last. And not only that, we stress out about it. We really do. I mean, we treat, we treat them like it's going to be this way forever. This is the problem. And we ought not to do it. It's a temporary situation that we're in. And in light of eternity, eternity will far outweigh it. It far outweighs anything that you're dealing with today. Paul says, fix your eyes on that. Fixate on it. Focus on that the eternity that we have to come. That's what our focus should be. That, that, can bring, that can bring a lot of things around in the difficulty of our lives, in the struggles that we may have. If we can focus on what is to come, the eternity and the glory that is to come. I'll close with this. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, the first part of the chapter. I'm just going to read down through verse 4. I won't tell you who the author is, but see if you notice a little familiarity here. <clears throat> it says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. I think about 
how Paul gives us this encouragement. Now here he, he, this, I guess, yeah, the author's Paul. He gives us these encouragements, and, it, and you'll flip to another letter. He's writing in a different way. And it's the same with the gospel. He'll present the gospel, right, always with those same elements, and you turn to another letter or you turn to another verse, and he's, he's presenting it in another way. He's saying the same thing in another way. And we have that in Scripture. We have that in the Scripture. What an encouragement that is. I hope you're in the Word. I hope you're in the Word. It is, quite frankly, impossible to focus on eternal things of God and not be in the Word. Because this world, man, it, it'll drag you down. Uh, let's face it. I mean, we, we all carry around the world in our pockets, don't we? And it's constantly reminding us <laughs> that this place has fallen, right? And if, how easy is it for that to become our focus? It's ridiculous easy. <laughs> like, it's, it, it's sad how easy it is for that to become the focus. And yet, we should be focused on the eternal glory that is to come. We will be raised to life in Christ. The message is this, stay true to the word in Christ alone. It is only in God's power. The gospel is simple. We can speak the truth plainly. Paul gives us the but nots, not crushed, not in despair, not abandoned, not destroyed. Why? Because we who believe are living in the resurrection of Jesus. We, we have the resurrection of life. Like, that is what we have to look forward to. And finally, we fix our eyes on the eternal glory that is to come. Remember, temporary, light, momentary, and temporary, right? That is, what, that is where we are now. Fix your eyes on the eternal glory that is to come. Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you, Lord, for Paul's encouragement. God, it's just, it's amazing to think about what you have in store for those that love you. Lord, for those that have believed and put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ, we experience that now in a way. God, we, we do have your light and your glory within us. So Lord, help us to share that with others, to not be discouraged based on their reception of it, Lord, but to continue to carry joy because we have the very words of life. Lord, help us to be ministers of the gospel in a way that is pleasing. And Father, help us also to keep our focus on what is to come. Lord, help us to be focused on eternity. And Lord, to take encouragement from that. Not just here on a Sunday, Lord, as, as I'm preaching, but God, each and every day, the opportunity to live in the light of Christ. Help us to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have our closing hymn this morning.